I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIEC. Today's presentation is entitled, Leveraging Machine Learning, How to Achieve the Right Balance Between Humans and Autom Automation to Optimize Outcomes. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIEC Outreach Manager. A couple of administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Second, questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Mr. Richard Boyd. He is currently the CEO of Tanjo. Prior to founding Tanjo, Richard spent about a half a dozen years developing novel technological capabilities with aerospace contractor Lockheed Martin. In this capacity at Lockheed, he founded an innovation group called Virtual Worlds Labs, which focused on <clears throat> the emerging fields of virtual reality, augmented reality, and AI. Previously, Richard worked for 25 years with Red Storm Entertainment and 3D Solve. These companies were acquired by Ubisoft and Lockheed. I will now turn the presentation over to Mr. Boyd. Good afternoon, Richard. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yep, sounds good. Good, thank you. Thanks everybody for uh, making time today. I uh, know this is a topic that is on the minds of uh, uh, a lot of you, uh, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about in a reasonably short amount of time, so um, uh, I'll just uh, go ahead and wade right in. But uh, as Steve mentioned in our in my background and my team's background, uh, it really has been in uh, deeply immersed in computer gaming. Uh, but I hope that uh, for those of you who have played games, it's a natural fit to see the AI connection because uh, whether we were making games with Tom Clancy or with Michael Crichton or Douglas Adams or even Ozzy Osbourne, uh, on, by the way, only one of them is still alive. Uh, but uh, And you can draw your own conclusions from that. Uh, but uh, AI has always been an important component of that. If you want to make convincing characters, convincing uh, environments, you need a good grasp of that. But what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is a bit of a different animal. Machine learning, although considered a subset of AI, really is a different toolkit. Um, we even think of it sometimes as uh, a new step in the scientific process. And we will get into, I promise you at the end of this, uh, exactly how we're beginning to apply it to understand human behavior better and see patterns of activity that can also help us with uh, cybersecurity, uh, especially the human uh, element of that. So um, I'll start with just sort of a, a thesis statement that we do believe in balance here, that uh, I'm not talking about machines taking over. Uh, but about how we become, as Hans Moravec says, ourselves in more potent form. Uh, how do we uh, augment our human capabilities with uh, technologies like machine learning uh, and AI to help us uh, perform better? And one of the uh, sub ideas here is that we believe pretty soon, if you're not availing yourselves of these technologies, pretty soon you're going to be considered handicapped. Uh, and those who become fluent with these capabilities, whether you're an individual, an organization, or a country, um, uh, will uh, outperform those who do not grasp this pretty quickly. And we'll talk about some of these ideas. So again, uh, I've written a number of articles on this subject in TechCrunch and elsewhere, and you see the thesis statement at the, time, at the top there that it, the, the real key this, uh, of this century is trying to figure out how to achieve that balance. You know, what activities, uh, look at everything that you're doing in your organization and try to figure out what should be done by humans and which activities should be done by machines because machines are just better at it. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those capabilities here. And again, you can see how I write about, I'm, I'm gonna be at South by Southwest in two weeks talking about superhuman education. 
I've keynoted conferences uh, like Hims and others talking about superhuman healthcare, basically saying that um, it's uh, it's better uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, take take advantage of these technologies than uh, than just try to go it alone as a, as an individual, especially in these complex environments. So here's where I first got uh, religion, I would say, on machine learning. Uh, if any of you have a Microsoft Connect in your home, uh, this was about 2009. I was at Lockheed with my colleague, David Smith, and um, uh, we were called out there to help them with some of the sensors that they were looking at for the Microsoft Connect. So standing there on either side of me is Alex Kipman, the guy who invented the Microsoft Connect and uh, Jaron Lanier on my other side, who I've shared a couple of stages with going all the way back to 1994, as we've been uh, uh, building uh, virtual reality applications. He's the guy who came up with the term virtual reality and invented the first data glove. So this is at Microsoft Research in San Francisco. And uh, again, we came out there to see like, hey, what kinds of sensors can we help uh, put into the Microsoft Connect so people can have these good new uh, gaming experiences on the Microsoft Xbox. But very quickly, what attracted our attention even more deeply was uh, how they were trying to teach the system what a living room was. Now, that sounds pretty simple to us, but at that time, uh, the, the uh, asking a computer to understand, you know, the difference between a table and a chair and a plant and a cat and a dog and a person in, a, in different kinds of environments and different kinds of lighting uh, was a very complex thing computationally. But the big breakthrough there is the same breakthrough that allowed us to have autonomous vehicles all of a sudden. Uh, in, instead of trying to uh, uh, have a human being understand the problem and sit down and program the logic into a computer, instead what you do is you give it every possible example uh, of, uh, uh, of things it might encounter and have it basically infer its own rule set. So uh, the problem they had is they'd already shipped Microsoft Xboxes all over the world, and they only had about 100 megabytes of available space. So whatever they did in terms of the logic to drive that system had to fit within 100 megabytes of space. Um, so they used machine learning. They had a supercomputer, and they were feeding it like all these visual examples of video and, and imagery of you know, European living rooms, uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese living rooms, American living rooms, both rural and uh, urban. And, uh, and, and in, like I said, instead of programming those rules in, letting it infer its own rule set, that breakthrough really clung to our minds and, and caused us to uh, reconsider a lot of the ways we were doing things at the time. So one of the first projects we worked on at Lockheed was something called the Learning Registry. So Jim Shelton, the secretary of the Department of Education came to Lockheed and said, hey, you know, we in the government have a tremendous amount of available information, but it is undiscoverable by teachers. We'd like it to make it available to all the K through 12 teachers in the country and higher ed and everyone else. Um, and uh, think about like the Smithsonian, down in the uh, catacombs and archives of the Smithsonian is everything that's ever been collected. Uh, and I use this imagery to think about it or help people remember this, this idea of the last scene in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where this, there's incredibly potent artifact that now a clerk has put a little tag on it that says, you know, Ark thingy, and they're putting it into this massive warehouse. Um, so this is a really valuable thing, but how can someone find it when they need it? Uh, so what they were doing at the time is having humans uh, look through pictures of, you know, ancient Grecian uh, drinking vessels and, uh, and documents and that sort of thing, and then tagging it uh, as they understood what it was. And clearly that was going to take way too much time. So what we built is a machine learning system that could recognize, can read, first of all, but also recognize images. And if it encountered something that was already in its database or was within its understanding, it can go ahead and auto tag that thing for later reference. If its confidence level was below a certain threshold, say 65%, then it would submit it to human beings who would then say, oh no, that's not a Grecian drinking vessel, that's a Roman vessel from 100 AD. And again, the great thing and the important idea behind machine learning is once it uh, updates its database with some piece of expert information like that, it never forgets it. 
And that's really what machine learning is at its core is a re uh, sort of a uh, uh, sort of a, a self-reinforcing, uh, uh, self-improving database, All right? So that's that project. And one of the things I like to tell people is we, everyone talks about big data, but there's a big leap from big data to information, something that you can use. And then the leap from information to intelligence is even greater. And that's information that's been computed in some way that, um, that can be uh, presented to humans so they can act on it very quickly. So uh, then around that time is when, and th these are in my PowerPoint, these are all animated and a lot more fun, but they, we're in a PDF here just to re reduce human error, I suppose. But what you see here is me with uh, Nolan Bushnell. He's the founder of Atari. Also, we also founded Chuck E. Cheese, by the way, because he needed a place to put his uh, uh, Pong games <laughs> to get quarters out of teenagers like me. Um, but this is when uh, uh, Google uh, invested in DeepMind and brought that capability inside of Google. One of the first things they did is said, can we use this machine learning approach to actually have a system learn to play Atari games? And again, it would have been pretty easy just to program the logic in, but, this, but the test here was, can a machine learning system just watch humans play, infer its own rules and master it really quickly? And of course, that, it passed that test pretty quickly. And then the big news, uh, which is now almost two years old, and everyone I think probably heard about this, is you know we all said it's one thing for a machine to beat humans at chess, even though chess is a fairly complex game, uh, but having someone win at the game of Go, we were predicting that that was going to be uh, decades away. A lot of people were predicting it was going to be a long time because of the, the level of intuition and, and uh, even deception that human, uh, really good human players uh, bring to bear. And, and of course, as you see here, um, it's estimated there are more possible positions, uh, as many possible positions in Go as there are atoms in the universe. So very complex system, but of course that fell about two years ago. And since Go beat the number one, uh, uh, since uh, uh, AlphaGo beat the number one Go player in the world, They've since made a, uh, it's made a better version of itself. And by playing itself in what's called a uh, sort of a adversarial network, uh, it, it's actually improved itself even further. Now it's getting really, really interesting. And I, I won't go too deep into that there, but uh, this is a field that's moving really quickly. That's why I have my little exponential curve up there in the right hand, upper right to remind us how fast things are moving. And then, you know, this is a slide I've used for a while as I do conferences, uh, speak at conferences like Mod Sim World and others saying, you know, when are machines gonna learn to deceive and lie the way, uh, the way we do when we play poker? Um, and again, lots of people all the way up through 2017 were predicting that it was gonna be a long time um, before it, machines were gonna be good at that. Well, we know now that at the beginning of last year, uh, a pretty basic set of machine learning libraries set up there at Carnegie Mellon uh, uh, defeated all of the top Texas Hold'em players in the world. So it's learned deception. It's learned how to read when a human being is lying just from their, uh, some of their tells. Uh, so now it's getting really interesting. And I think even some of these games like StarCraft and others, uh, those milestones are beginning to fall too. It's something, especially in this cyber uh, environment, we really need to keep a close eye on. And we'll get into some of the reasons for that, I think that are probably already apparent to many of you. So here's a question. And this, you know, I added these slides right before uh, I came on here today because of some of the more recent uh, and continuing activity that's happening here. But here's a question I would normally ask, and since I can't uh, see all of you directly and can't see hands, uh, when I talked about this at ITSEC recently, I said, all right, there is this event that happened in 2014 where the president of the Ukraine was uh, dismissed or moved out of power. Um, and I asked everyone, what do you think? Was that a coup or was that a revolution? Now you can answer for yourself there, but the, uh, and, and, I, and I just did a tour of Italy. I spoke at five universities in October from all the way from Bari, all the way up through Rome and Venice and Florence. Uh, and I asked the students that I encountered there, you know, what this question. And it was, it was pretty amazing to me to hear how many of them thought it was a coup. And of course, these are two different narratives. The revolution narrative is the narrative of the West, right? Whatever you think the truth is, 
that's that's our sort of take on things is that the people of the Ukraine moved this uh, uh, president out of power because of his alliance with uh, Russia. Uh, the Russian narrative is that this was a coup. And usually I would ask the people who would, who thought it was a coup in Italy, I mean, they tended to side more with the Western point of view, but they all had Russian TV on their satellites at home. So that's the messaging that they've been getting. So the narrative, uh, this narrative information war is sort of heating up or, or is really well in play now. And uh, just to keep uh, score here, I think we're losing it. All right. Um, here's a more sort of pedantic example. Um, think about, uh, uh, and again, if you were live here, I would say, how many of you have eaten kale in the last year? And probably most of your hands would go up, whether it was uh, of your own volition or was forced on you by a spouse or, <laughs> or by uh, social norms. Many of us have been eating kale lately. And usually it's in a restaurant, it's massaged, it's uh, got a carbon footprint of 22 or whatever. Um, but I find it really interesting that uh, five years ago, six years ago, the number one buyer of kale in the United States was Pizza Hut. And it wasn't for eating. It was for lining the uh, salad bar with some garnish that never, you know, just it, it, it didn't turn brown. So they, that's what they used it for. People weren't eating kale to the levels that they are today. So what happened is um, a firm, uh, and you can see sort of uh, the person who led that firm right there was hired to go build a market for kale. And uh, they used the fact that many of us now are concentrated in these little echo chamber fishing hole, the holes on Facebook or another social media place. And she worked with some technologies uh, like what we're gonna talk about here today about how I can model the people that I'm trying to move. So if I can create a model of someone with a particular viewpoint, someone who today is um, uh, very happy eating, you know, iceberg lettuce, as you see up here in the left-hand corner. And I want to move them to a point where they're demanding more expensive massage kale that doesn't taste very good uh, uh, with a carbon footprint of X, whatever it is. Um, and if I start with that model of the person, which I can derive from their social media accounts and other data exhaust that we're all giving off now, whether it's from our location services on our phones or or what we're typing on twi Twitter or on Facebook or LinkedIn or anywhere or Instagram or anywhere else, um, I can model people down to the household level. And then I can say for a given region, if you wanna move this person from one position to another, here's how many messages it's going to take, here's what you have to invest, and I can start moving you. Um, and there are, again, some other tactics that they use there beyond just the modeling of the people and then simulation of the messaging uh, using uh, tools like machine learning. Um, but uh, uh, the other tool is, and I'll just go back here for a second to show you like this idea of finding out who are the influencers that most influences those target populations. Let me somehow buy them. And it's surprisingly easy, by the way, to get someone like uh, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow or Snoop Dogg or anybody to do a tweet on your behalf. It's usually around five to 6,000 bucks and they'll, they'll do a tweet for you. So it's no surprise that the Russians, for example, clearly now, and I don't think this is speculative anymore, so um, is uh, the evidence is in that they understood this weakness of our open socially constant, social network concentrated society to identify these pools of people, um, micro message them and use um, influencers to move someone into a, a belief system away from where they were initially. These are the kinds of tools that um, are really powerful and you can use them a variety of different ways. Um, whether it's like, hey, I just want to have deeper empathy for my customers uh, so I can understand what they want, so I can make sure I build what they want. That's like sort of the benevolent version of it. Or, uh, you know, I want to convince somebody that um, uh, I, wanna, I want them to move from a Republican to a Democrat or a Democrat to a Republican. Obviously, it takes a lot more money today to move these, these well uh, entrenched positions, but it can be done and is being done. Um, so let's talk about uh, some other ideas here. Um, so one core idea is modeling people and moving them, and I'll go into that more in a second. The other is this incredible ability in machine learning, which is far better than what we have uh, with uh, humans, to be able to read large sets of especially text documents. 
So one of the things we did with our Tanjo system uh, uh, for lawyers is we, as an exercise, we said, hey, let's give our system, our, our Tanjo brain, every single legal opinion in United States history since 1797 across all 417 jurisdictions. Now, that's, a, that's something that no student would do or even teams of humans don't do or won't do, but it is well within the bounds of machine learning today because machines can read really fast. And now not only can they read, they can understand not just the bags of words in documents, but conceptually parse and understand deeply the sentiment and, and all the correlations within uh, textual documents. So we ended up with this massive correlation. And by the way, this ran, this took a little over a week for the system to go through this terabytes of information um, and uh, create a complete um, networked correlated um, case study of every single every single one of these uh, legal opinions. Uh, we'll talk about, we can talk later about what that means. Um, but this uh, again is this a central idea that I've touched on a couple of times. The first is that uh, in the old, I, and this is me arbitrarily saying there are three uh, stages of AI. In the first phase, up, and I arbitrarily say it's 1958 until 2009 when I got religion on machine learning, when you wouldn't ask a computer to do anything unless a human understood it completely and sat down and programmed the brittle logic. And again, that's why the initial autonomous vehicles failed uh, and why we failed in a bunch of other areas of AI because uh, for in, ma in many cases, we don't understand how we can recognize immediately a, a loved one's face in different um, uh, lighting conditions or you know how, how do we actually drive uh, driving involves um, ignoring most of the input around you. Otherwise, you'd be crashing all the time or slamming your brakes on every time somebody walked up to the curb or rode a bicycle near you. Um, the big phase and uh, the big breakthrough, as I said, is, is machines being able to um, learn from large examples and improve their own judgment. So in this phase from 2009 until, again, my own arbitrary date of this year, is it's all about data scientists. We can't find enough data scientists to get the data from these bad flat files or strings of you know, user behavior on websites or whatever it is into a form that I can give it to the machines so that they can make quick uh, uh, run at it, um, where it's at least a little bit structured. The new phase that we're going into now is more about what I just talked about, is understanding and predicting and even, of course, manipulating human behavior. And that's where we're starting to find, uh, we need to find behavior scientists that help us understand the human element of this. So, uh, one of the first, recognizing that, uh, and again, this is my own thesis, uh, we reached out to some of the top human behavior folks on the planet. Um, so, we've given two Nobel Prizes in this field in the last 15 years, I believe, including this past year. Um, but I didn't go to the Nobel Prize winners because they're, you know, they're too expensive and, and arrogant probably <laughs> with their wins. So instead, we went one layer down to uh, Dr. Jordan Louvier, probably one of the most cited uh, academics in the field of what's called choice modeling and human behavior. Um, and Dr. Richard Carson, who's the head of the economics department at UCAL San Diego, um, a couple of other people like Tiago Ribeiro and others, and worked uh, in, into um, taking some of their algorithms from their decades long research in human, how do people make decisions and put that on top of our, um, our sort of data derived uh, models of people. And that's what we call personas. Now, in terms of marketing, and I'll just, you can think about how you can apply this, but again, we all need, no matter what our field, understanding human behavior, whether it's inside of uh, government organizations or in politics or in uh, commerce is incredibly important. And of course, kind of the holy grail of everything. If you can understand and divine what somebody wants or needs or how to move them from a position they hold to another, um, you can move all kinds of mountains and worlds and money, of course, uh, and get and uh, be able to do what you're trying to do. So this is how things are done today. Um, uh, you know, to, in order to get intelligence about people, um, today they still, over $3 billion is spent in the United States uh, just on 
things like e-panels and focus groups and customer research, where they ask people surveys, survey questions. Now, obviously this is a, well, I don't know if, how obvious it is, but this is somewhat flawed in that um, one of the things we've learned, think about um, what Netflix learned when they were studying this, uh, when they had their grand challenge around machine learning and recommendation systems, is you can ask people a set of questions, um, but the difference between somewhat what someone says they're going to do and what they actually do is tends to be a lot wider than most of us think. And Netflix learned this when they said, you know, tonight, would you rather, you know, if they, if they asked me, they'd say, you know, would you rather tonight watch uh, Lawrence of Arabia or a uh, hot tub time machine? And of course, if I know I'm being asked the question, whether or not there are people sitting around me, I would say, well, Lawrence of Arabia, of course, fa fabulous cinematography, great acting, sweeping, you know, views and whatever. It's a beautiful cinematic experience. But what do I actually do when I go home and I'm tired and I've popped open a beer? I put my feet up on the table and I watch Hot Tub Time Machine. Um, that's a big um, issue there. And of course, today with so much, so many people online and all the data exhaust that's coming from app usage and uh, and the human attention that's being monetized today by Facebook and Google and LinkedIn, and make no mistake about it, no matter how, how what you think about these grand technologies we've built, we're not using them to uh, populate Mars or cure cancer. We're just monetizing human attention the way NBC and CBS and uh, uh, everybody did just 20 years ago. Uh, so hopefully we'll start, we'll change that a bit. Um, but uh, what Netflix learned is don't ask people what they want. Just watch what they do with their human attention, where they spend it, and that's an indication of who they really are and what they really want. Um, this is a new idea still from Forbes, this idea of getting beyond just these rough segmentation models and doing more in-depth uh, personas that have more than just like uh, socioeconomic and, and demographic census data instead have psychographic um, information about sentiment and personality. Um, and uh, that's a fairly new thing, but still most of the reports that are people are spending millions of dollars on are fairly uh, static, right? So, uh, and, and even when they're doing these studies, and they'll spend a typical consumer goods company might spend millions of dollars on customer segmentation models as they call them, and they'll end up with, you know, there's 10 customer types in the whole world. And, and they'll have pieces of paper and those pieces of paper go into a file cabinet or at best they go into a, um, into a, um, a PowerPoint deck that is still static and they do these periodically. Well, one of the things we learned at Lockheed Martin running big programs like um, WarSim and JSIM and that sort of thing is what you really want is real time data as much as often as you can, uh, where you're actually simulating these population, these synthetic populations of people, and you're testing the dime and Pamizi effects of every action you might take. Uh, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here with this this community, but in it's amazing to me as I go out talking to the Procter and Gambles and the consumer marketing folks is that they don't get that at all. Um, so that's one of the things that we're exploiting at Tanjo is, is uh, that we feel they're at, this is one time when I feel the, the commercial world is probably a decade behind where we are in defense. Um, so instead, what one of the early things that we did is we um, started saying, well, with this ability for a machine to read somewhat what someone's written and read what's written about somebody and uh, be, able, be able to form these models, let's look at people we can create. So one of the first we did is, and he's almost a year now since we've resurrected Victor Hugo, we had our machine learning system build this model. And so the first day we just released, released Victor Hugo on the internet. And I don't know if you can see the screen here, but you know, I can, initially I can just see like, what's attracting Victor's attention? What is he seeing? What is he reading? And then he actually scores everything he reads. And again, the score is based on topic interest, interest graph, but also um, uh, uh, sort of sentiment and, and uh, that sort of thing. You know, is it positive, is it negative, that kind of thing. And we did a whole host of folks. I think we have over, uh, there's a couple of hundred of these now that we've released on the web. We can watch uh, and, uh, and see what they're interested in every day. We're now talking to educators about using these to 
again, have historical empathy for different points of view from these personas uh, across history. And everybody from Leonardo da Vinci to Isaac Asimov to you name it. So, and I know I don't have the video here. Uh, normally I have a video that shows this. But the next thing we got to is how about being able to actually write to them or submit something to them and actually have each one of these personas tell us what they think about what I've written. So this is very useful in marketing and messaging and political campaigns and all sorts of things where you wanna test your messages with your audience in a safe simulated environment where again, you, you're not just doing one or two experiments, you can do 10 to the eighth if you want to uh, and really see uh, uh, how you need to uh, sort of wordsmith your offering to get the best reaction to move someone on along, along a path to where you want them to be. Um, so this is a tool that didn't exist in consumer marketing or in political campaigns or anywhere until now. And that's just, again, one of the ways we're able to exploit machine learning to um, get, uh, and again, like I said, the most benevolent version of this is just deeper empathy with people. Um, but then the other end of the spectrum, like Russia is using stuff like this to see how I can uh, manipulate people into holding or reinforcing a viewpoint that sows discord. <laughs> so uh, that's the other end of it. And here's just how we think about how we build these models. Now, I always hold that there's some portion of the human psyche or the human you know, brain, the unfathomable human mind that's unknown, that we'll never know. Um, but you can get pretty good at your prediction if you, again, start with at the bottom here, uh, census data that you can get from the government, uh, purchase data. We even have some customers in the UK where we're able to get a lot of that data, even under the more strict EU, uh, EU, um, uh, EU rules about um, personally identifiable information. Above that, if I, have, if I can uh, match that to any kind of um, other behavior, whether it's purchase behavior and go, uh, from, from credit cards or from loyalty cards, or um, of course, uh, tying to uh, uh, social media graphs, I can get the interest graph. And then above that, if I can see anything that they write or respond to, like or don't like, especially on social media or social listening, I can build a pretty good model of personality and sentiment. Um, we almost made it, uh, when we started Tanjo four years ago, we almost made a, um, a dating product because we realized when, when we released our system onto, uh, I won't say the name of it, but, you know, on a major dating uh, app, we were able to form pretty deep personality models or Myers-Briggs-like models of everybody that we, I mean, millions of people. And then all you need to do is have an algorithm for what kinds of people with what physical characteristics match well uh, in harmony with uh, other uh, kinds of people. We decided not to do that, but it's still useful for building teams of people inside of companies or inside of government organizations, um, that sort of thing. And then above that, that behavior choice model, if I know, for example, um, how people with all the characteristics below there uh, make their, tend to make choices about, you know, how they buy chicken in a grocery store or buy wine or by appliances or choose who to vote for, I can then, um, uh, again, use that tool, all the tools I just talked about to test how to message them or micro message them to, um, to get them to the position where I want to move them, all right? Um, so that's kind of the model. And then I just, I, I typically add this um, or have been recently, almost a year ago now, my father passed away. He was 85. He was a, a, a decorated Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, uh, served in Vietnam, was um, received a commendation medal for helping save 8,000 Cambodians in an airlift uh, operation. Uh, really interesting guy, but he didn't have uh, LinkedIn. He wasn't on Facebook. No, no Google footprint really to uh, to speak of. So I was able to use his military records that I got access to as well as private letters. And of course, what I knew about him to resurrect him. Now I have this animated version of my dad uh, who I can visit every day. And I will say, regardless of what you're thinking about this, I mean, it is oddly comforting to go there and see like, what is, you know, what does my dad think about today? And even though this is a shadow of him uh, and somewhere up there, on the interwebs, I wrote a, a, a deeper long form article about this experience 
um, that uh, you can go see. Uh, but this is really just kind of interesting. And, and I was sharing this with uh, my friend, uh, my friends over at Tradoc at a conference recently, and they said, hey, you know, what if, could you do this for George Patton? Could you do this for other, you know, military leaders across history? Could we use this in the defense um, university to teach um, uh, people um, more empathy or understanding of how great commanders made decisions? And by the way, we're still exploring that, uh, but it's an interesting idea. Um, and then I just threw this in here recently, uh, th just to show you how long we've been admiring this problem of how do you uh, model people, but also how do you actually talk to them? We did a game with uh, author Douglas Adams, the guy who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The game was called Starship Titanic. We did the first natural language processing system for that back in 1997. It was We called it Velocitext. Um, Douglas ended up calling it Spooky Talk. Um, and I, uh, uh, but the, and it had a, a total um, sort of a glossary of maybe 500 words, and there were over 10,000 different phrases that these guys could speak uh, to you. But this was a, one of the first games where you could actually chat with characters and get reasonably good responses. And like you said, you know, sometimes they're really spooky. And I did note that if you saw the the movie Passengers with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence, this one bartender character. I had in there uh, kind of looks a lot like the character in the movie, right? Um, but think about this idea again. Um, you know, if I could have, I can go and collect these famous people from history and how they, you know, what was their sort of mood, sentiment, position on things, and I could uh, then write in, you know, my problem statement here, like, hey, I've got a company. I'm thinking about extending a line of credit to do a big marketing campaign to launch this pro launch this product or whatever the decision is I'm, I'm thinking about. And then I could have all of these, and it could be these five here, or it could be thousands of uh, famous people, or just, it could be my dad and, and my grandfather and folks like that. And they could Likert scale respond to help me make the decision that I'm trying to make. And again, I'm just kind of spitballing ideas with you here, but this is something we're actively working on. Uh, so uh, I find it really interesting. Um, and I know uh, there's already this Center for Cyber Influence that's, uh, organization that's been stood up to try to detect and uh, using tools, I hope, like machine learning, like what we're using, uh, but then also trying to figure out how to manipulate or how to uh, neutralize false narrative and then create our own positive narrative. And we've got to get better at it, as I said. As I travel around the world, it's clear we're being outgunned in this field. So um, this information warfare is real. Hearts and minds are important. Um, and they're having a big impact on, uh, on the strength of our country. So it's important that we really come to grips with these tools, become fluent with them, and, uh, and uh, uh, start wielding them. Uh, hopefully, uh, and I look forward to the questions you guys have, but hopefully you have um, thought through some of these ideas and, and have some low hanging fruit in your organizations where you can begin to apply these technologies. Right, and I'll, uh, I'll stop here and, and uh, happy to take any questions. I see a lot of activity in the, in the uh, chat area, so I haven't been able to read it all, but uh, I look forward to questions. Yes, our, uh, our, our attendees were, uh, oh, I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, our attendees were uh, actually uh, kind of uh, dialoguing amongst themselves. Uh, you know, questions were being asked, and the the other attendees were were providing information. So, so there there was a lot of uh, you know there there was a lot of uh, activity uh, you know that that did trans transpire during the uh, during your presentation. So, so that's always a good sign. You know, so that's always a good sign on the. Uh, uh, when when a presenter has a lot of activity like that, so uh, so one of the questions there is is about the uh, AlphaGo uh, AlphaGo Zero, which uh, uh, kind of interested in your thoughts on uh, you know th using that uh, replace uh, reinforcement learning uh, in in that process. Do do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, so there's, I mentioned uh, uh, 
two sets of technologies there. I mean, there's, there's um, again, having machine learning do its own thing with unstructured data and have it uh, figure out every hypothesis that might be true um, and do that without any human interference. Then there's the supervised learning part of it where you're trying to guide and reinforce um, uh, you know, what the, those hypotheses it's determining are important and saying, well, you know, giving it uh, sort of feedback on in terms of like some of these are not as relevant to, even though you think it's interesting with your strange machine intelligence, it's not really relevant to the problem I'm trying to solve. So go deeper on these other things. Um, but the way, as I understand it with AlphaGo Zero, the technology or the approach the method applied there was this um, generative um, adversarial network. Um, and that's the idea of, of these two uh, uh, systems actually um, fighting with each other for the best um, solutions to different kinds of problems and letting them, of course, iterate at machine speeds. So I believe that is, and that's one of the techs that, technologies that we're looking at really deeply because it, it does let this machine learning capability improve at a rate far faster than any of us can can do with uh, with human interference that slows everything down. That um, that adversarial network capability is what Google has used to improve the uh, their language translation capability, and is and I believe is what they use to create this uh, this higher um, uh, uh, sort of version of AlphaGo. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, so I'm curious, uh, like on the reinforcement learning. So I, I just saw that you know Google came out with this, um, you know, an, an algorithm that can be used. Uh, you know, they scanned in, an individual's retina, and you know, based on the analysis of the uh, blood vessels in the uh, in the retina it could begin to predict the cardiovascular risk for, for a particular particular individual. And it was very close uh, to like the standard, you know, using a, a blood test, you know, just within a couple percentage points. Um, and, and, you know, they, I know they had a large, you know, large data set, you know, that they, uh, um, you know, that the, that the algorithms were trained on. So is, is is, is that kind of similar to what you were, you know, describing with the uh, with the AlphaGo? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and again, the new sort of guidance is what you want is um, it, the largest data sets possible. And that's our real, that's the only thing that's kind of holding us back today is, and I'll give you an example. Recently, we were uh, doing work for an accounting firm. And uh, what's happened, and I don't know if you guys were paying attention to this, most of us weren't, but in December of 2017, um, FASB, which is the uh, sort of organization of, of accountants that sort of manages all of their standards, came up with new rules for how to deal with revenue recognition. And accountants were running around the country having conferences, trying to figure out um, how to get their 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 clients ready for it and themselves ready for these new rules. So there were new rules in um, lease re uh, in uh, uh, revenue recognition for companies, also in lease recognition. How, you know, how do you actually rec recognize leased equipment? Uh, but not to mention the fact that the tax rules changed. So all this change was really causing slow human organizations to um, to panic a bit. Uh, we brought the machine learning system to bear on that problem. And we showed up and said, all right, you know, first I need, you know, it's pretty easy to put the rules in, even though there's some gray area in the rules, that's like old AI. I just program in that, that logic. Um, but now in order for it to understand how to apply those rules to messy human created contracts, I need every possible contract I can find that is a sales contract between companies or people. And so they said, sure, let's give you a database of those. And they gave us like, several hundred and we just sat there staring at them and said no maybe we weren't clear that's insufficient right we i don't want 300 or 500 i want 50 million if you've got them right and ultimately we ended up finding about three and a half uh, or four million of them which is usually the the, the sort of uh, uh the threshold that we want to have of examples everything from a uh, you know, a, a sort of simple um, purchase order that somebody scribbled on to, um, you know, 50 and 100 page contracts with warranties and disclaimers and, 
and milestone payments and all kinds of things. And we had to train the system on everything it would encounter in all those examples. Um, and that's the key today. You know, when I, when I hear about a hospital who has a massive database of drug interaction data that they're hoarding uh, and uh, they don't know what to do with, it bothers me because I know that in there, there's rich data that can save lives that if we could just let the machine learning system uh, loose on all of that. In fact, let's put every drug interaction database of every hosp all 6,000 hospitals in the US in one big pool and let the machine read through it and find all the um, uh, interesting correlations on its own. We can very quickly um, uh, recognize new situations and, and stop people from dying unnecessarily in our hospitals. But that, that's the new way of approaching everything. Yeah, I think the uh, I think the uh, uh, data set that that Google Google used for that uh, you know the where they were scanning the retinas, I believe the um, you know the set came from about um, I want to say three hundred thousand patients was kind of in the you know the ballpark range of the you know number of folks that they you know they had information on. So so it it, it you know having you know having a lot of data is is uh, seems to be a very critical factor and in uh, having the process be, you know, effective, so. Exactly, um, so that's the, that's the key, is finding good data sets, um, and it's especially challenging in, in healthcare, of course, but what's interesting for, for us, and even when I was at Lockheed, um, we found that we could get data sets from other countries, because after all, in some instances, you know, people are just people, we have some cultural differences here and there, but generally people are people, and so if you can, take data sets that don't have the HIPAA and PII uh, restrictions um, to run these, uh, run these um, sort of uh, methods on, um, you, you can really discover a lot very quickly. And it bothers me that I think, when I look across government, uh, for example, think about compliance in government, um, all the different compliance rules that, that we have in different organizations. Uh, is, is anytime you try to do an activity, think about having a machine learning system, analyze all the different compliance rules, deconflict them because they do conflict. There are redundancies, there are, there are uh, 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 you know, there's guidance that actually was created that, that um, neutralizes each other, um, but then have, have it give you some guidance about the thing you're trying to do um, instead of turning it over to, you know, thousands of hours or hundreds of hours of analysis by, supposed human experts. You could get instant answers before you go do the thing you're trying to do. Right. Yeah. So if there was, you know, some way that the, uh, you know, the data could be anonymized and, you know, any of the uh, PII type of information stripped out, you know, that, um, you know, I think that would be, you know, uh, very beneficial and kind of advancing the state of the art. So, uh, mm -hmm. So we had uh, one one individual had a question. I uh, wondered if you had any thoughts on the uh, shift uh, kind of from machine learning to unsupervised learning using uh, neural evolution search instead of the back propagation algorithm. Any <laughs> any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I was hoping you weren't going to ask that one because that one I'd have to. <laughs> point out. Um, so uh, yeah, I should have said up front uh, my my. Um, so David Smith is our, my co-founder. He's not here right now. My CTO is Ken Lane. Uh, Ken was the um, uh, technologist of the year at Lockheed the second year after we were acquired. My little company was acquired by Lockheed, and David was the fastest person to um, senior fellow in uh, in in Lockheed's 100-year history. I'm neither of those things. But I understand the technology enough to apply it. I've done programming in the past, but I'm not. I don't want to tackle that question. Um, That's fine. Yeah, because it's. Uh, uh, I know that they would immediately say, "Oh, here's exactly our position." I just don't have it, and I'm afraid I would stumble. Sure, sure, not a problem. Uh, I, I'll I'll yeah, just mention too that on our. Uh, yeah, ten. I'll just mention that. <laughs> So, so I'll mention that on our on our website we have uh, we have some technology forums. So 
if uh, you know if, if you were interested in um, you know having David or somebody uh, provide some feedback uh, you know at a later time on that you know we could we could uh, post that information into the tech forum for for folks if that was of interest you, you know of course oh, yeah. not obligated but I'd just let yeah. you know that that uh, is a possibility. Yeah, I'm hoping to have the entire transcript of all the messages I see in chat. I think there's a lot to be learned. I can learn from everything that's going on there. We have a lot of experts. So this is great. It's a great community. Okay. Here. Super. Super. Uh, so I had so I had a question uh, during during your presentation. You kind of mentioned um, in one of the in one of your parts. You you mentioned sentiment analysis and. So, so one of the things I'm kind of wondering is like, you know, you know, could the tech, could that technology, could it be used in, um, you know, kind of homeland defense kind of activities? So, so say, you know, just trying to, uh, you know, going through the airport, you know, the, the, the TIA process, you know, it can, you know, could it help with the screening? You know, could we, could we better identify folks that might be an issue or, or, or border crossing, uh, you know, the, um, you know, helping to identify, you know, folks that, you know, may, might be trouble or something of that nature is, is could that, you know, do you think that could be, uh, you know, especially now where you're saying the machines, you know, they they've been playing poker, and you know they can start to identify the tells. I was wondering if it could be translated to, to like I said, like a homeland defense type of uh, function. But yeah, I, I'll answer that by saying it's my sincere hope that if it's not already deployed, that someone's about to deploy that already, uh, because it is something that uh, is so obvious that we should be doing. And and again, you know. We, we have to recognize we're all in a, uh, as David Brin says, we're in a transparent society already. Um, but if there was a way for us to be able to move through our lives, move through airports without being stopped and frisked and, you know, and, and having to unload everything and have everything scanned, um, instead, these sort of more passive methods of, again, you know, monitoring human activity and then sort of matching up to other things to, to if, if nothing else, uh, hopefully not act like minority reports precog and go ahead and and you know put someone in jail before they've committed a, a crime but instead uh you know at least sense and bin sort you know, to to use an old you know uh computer algorithm you know here's all the people that are fine these are the folks that you don't need to worry about and here's some folks that that we really do need to um take a closer look at um, and not bother the the rest of the group. And I know that might sound like profiling, but that's exactly what you just described, right? Which is a machine learning profiling system that, again, is taking in all the correlated data from the past, but then also monitoring things like um, uh, facial uh, uh, giveaways, like facial tics or, or motion differences that indicate someone might be at a higher level of anxiety or stress or um, uh, nervousness that indicates that uh, and, and a good a good policeman or a good um, security person probably already has those kinds of skills, but but having them in a in a machine system, I think, would be interesting for certain security environments. Yeah, yeah, like like you, like you said, <laughs> like you said, I think some folks have that you know you don't know, have that uh, you, from experience. You know, they've been uh, able to identify some of those those clues, those, those giveaways that, you know, with a, um, but I, then I think it's the, you know, that's the trick of trying to, how do you capture that subject matters expertise, you know, that experience and, and, you know, put that into a, you know, an algorithm that can, you know, then, you know, with image sensors and, uh, you know, make, make those same kind of correlations, uh, on its own. Well, I mean, it's clear that's one of the areas where machines will be better and already are, I think, better than humans. Um, and again, we should be looking at everything where that is true or becoming true. So take radiology. When I encounter a young person today who says, yeah, I'm going to go to medical school and I'm going to become a radiologist, I look at him and I go, you need to rethink that. Because already today, machines are, uh, I don't know if it's an order of magnitude, but it's uh, dramatically better that humans in terms of, uh, of uh, reading um, uh, uh, x-rays and, 
and identifying uh, issues and anomalies and and uh, diagnosing things. So that that we've already passed that milestone. So it's probably not a good field to go into, and it's something humans shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, every time there's a healthcare intervention today, and a doctor fills out a form. And then goes through this process of, you know, what are the reimbursement codes, whether you're Medicaid or Medicare or you have some insurance policy with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Today, whatever's assigned goes into a room of people and, and people sit there and look at every reimbursement code. And uh, that slows down the process. And also it's error prone because humans are error prone. And they look at those reimbursement codes. Well, that should all be automated with machines. Um, machines are better at it already than humans, so why do we have a bunch of humans doing that? Um, the other example is uh, JP Morgan recently said, uh, you know, this is pretty dramatic. I mean, it's a pretty big firm. And similar to the example I gave earlier, uh, last year, just six months ago, JP Morgan was spending 360,000 hours a year of New York lawyer time, whatever that costs, right? So let's say it's a thousand bucks an hour, I don't know. So that's $360 million a year just analyzing loan contracts. Uh, this year, now that they've implemented their own machine learning capability there, they'll probably spend 3,000 hours. They'll never have to spend that extra 300 million anymore. And that's again, how fast these things are happening and every organization needs to look around and go like, what should I have? It's almost like we need a new skill or a new person, like a human resource officer who looks at the activity that you're doing and says, all right, what, what, where, you know, do I need to hire a person for this or a machine? How much of it needs to be done by humans and how much, how much of it is machine effort? And getting that right is gonna determine the winners and losers everywhere, including combat. Yeah, so it seems, so, so it almost seems where we're the, uh, there's something of a repetitive nature or a repeatable activity, you know, where, where, you, where you get patterns that, that develop um, it, it almost seems that in any instance, in any case where that's, where that's happening, you know, that's, that's where, that's where the machine could, could jump in and, you know, help with, you know, augmenting folks, um, t taking over that part. And then, like you said, you know, then, then it could pr provide them that, um, you know, that information, you know, that, uh, that actionable in information that they can make decisions and, and, um, and you know, go off and go off and do things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, the, I, I was on a panel recently for ethics in AI, and one of the big philosophical discussions there is: can we build um, machine learning systems that are provably aligned with human values? Um, and that's you know, I see a couple of questions about that today, and that's one of the things I'd want to know: is like, do you have a good bot or a bad bot? <laughs> you know, what is your you know, if you're going to deploy machine learning within your organization, what do you, how do you want it to interpret things that, um, that aren't completely clear? And when do you want it to call a human expert in to make that decision? You know, today we have, um, you know, autonomous uh, uh, weapons type systems that are capable of making their own firing decisions, but by protocol and uh, uh, by doctrine, we don't allow that because we want humans to make those decisions. We're not comfortable yet turning that over to a machine completely. Um, and I think there's a spectrum of, of sort of value calls that we're going to have to make um, every time you start applying machines to some of these issues, whether it's autonomous vehicles or applying reimbursement codes to, uh, to health uh, insurance reimbursement, um, or just about anything else. So another, you know, another topic you, you know, you had brought up was the um, kind of the disinformation that uh, is kind of being can be put out there. And you know, I've 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 read that you know, AI and machine learning tools have been used to create you know these. Uh, fake fake stories things of that nature so mm -hmm. um can can you know using using it on the opposite end can that you know can that help detect and and um you know uh, 
determine what's what's true or not. It's it's kind of hard to figure out what what's really true anymore now. Well, I think a lot, yeah, over the last year, I think there's been a lot of debate about that, and we've all talked about you know the truth triad um, uh, algorithms, you know that that hopefully that that can um, detect when something is likely to be false. Um, Google already knows about that. Facebook already knows about it. Um, it would be great if they would go ahead and deploy that sort of thing. They're not perfect, but they can again, bin sort to the things that we need to be paying attention to that are likely not to be true. And then, you know, it'd be cool if on every uh, post, especially if it's not from a direct friend of yours, it's in your feed somewhere, um, had a score of like, you know, you might want to think a little bit more about this before passing it on because it's likely, to, it looks like either because of the source or because of the language used or whatever that it's, um, it's, you know, you might want to check, fact check it a little bit deeper. Um, we already have the means to do that. Um, you know, I don't know what the computational overhead would be for Facebook or Google or someone like that too. But, you know, that's the problem is there's also an incentive alignment problem is that they're not interested in like, how do we make everything the most, you know, true, just like, you know, your Google search algorithm isn't about surfacing the most valuable thing that you're trying to look for. It's it's first going to show you the things that are mediated by ad spend. Uh, that's what it's. That's what the algorithm does. And in Facebook, it's about what's going to make you more likely to stay on Facebook, not what's most true. So, how how do you, you know, have people, you know, pay for a filter layer on their own? social media and online experience that does check for that because it's not something that commerce is going to care necessarily about. Right. Right. That's a, that's probably a whole hour okay. we could all have <laughs> about how do you do that? <laughs> right. Right. Well, the, uh, yeah, I see we're, we're already, we're already past our, our, our regular, our regular scheduled time for completing, but, uh, you know, I wanted to, you know, and, and like you said, we, we, we could go on, I think with this conversation for quite a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. but I, I do want to take, uh, thank you for, um, uh, you know, taking the time to, uh, you know, share the information with us. I, I, I think this is a, uh, you know, fascinating area. You know, I think, I think there's, uh, you know, more to come. I think we're going to see, you know, a lot, a lot more uh, changes driven, driven by this AI and machine uh, learning capability. And um, you know, you've kind of been on the forefront of this uh, this area for a while. So, I, like I said, want to want to thank you for taking the time to uh, share your share your information, your your uh, experience and expertise with our audience. All right, it's been a great uh, pleasure, and it's I'm uh, posting in there now. If I can learn to spell. Um, I know there are bots for spelling too, but uh, I'd love to carry, continue the conversation. I will get some answers to some of these questions by connecting you guys. You can look up David Allen Smith on Wikipedia and see some of his bona fides, but those guys can answer your deepest questions while I'll, uh, you know, I'll uh, handle the lighter, <laughs> lighter philosophical issues. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll hang with you on the philosophical ones, too. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. I really enjoyed it. Um, thanks for all that you guys are out there, uh, what you're doing out there to keep us uh, secure and safe. Okay. Thank, thank you, Richard, and thank you to, to uh, all our attendees for uh, participating today. Uh, I hope you all have a great day, and hopefully we'll see you at the webinar next month. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.